Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Stories Rock. And uh, you know, there are always those things that you can always laugh about later, but not exactly when they're happening. So tonight you get to hear all about it. <laughs> Mistakes were made. True confessions, New Year's resolutions, and lessons learned eventually. Our next reader, Deb Sperling, was born and raised in New York City by at least three rabbis, an undertaker, and a Jamaican minister. <laughs> Since her college graduation, Deb has earned a living as a nonprofit administrator, a tabloid reporter, a giant dancing box of popcorn on the street, <laughs> a transporter of bodies for a corporate funeral home, and an obituary advisor for the DNC, among other positions. She currently works as something called a captionist, subtitling classes in real time to deaf and hard of hearing students at RIT. And a little known fact uh, about Deb, in 2016, at age 29, she almost died from a small stroke and then a massive internal hemorrhage, one right after the other, but in different par body parts, while living and teaching in uh, Argentina. Uh, that story, she hopes, will eventually become the subject of a memoir. But for tonight, she is going to share a more lighthearted travel story, and uh, it's called Fishing for Trouble. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> the country of Iceland, though now hypermodern, has a fairly recent history of deep poverty. This explains their affinity for the unusual delicacy known as Helkart, or fermented shark. Mm -hmm. The Greenland shark does not excrete its urine through an external channel, at least not right away. So toxic ammonia circulates throughout its bloodstream, making the shark poisonous to any would-be consumer. This is why the Icelanders, ingenious in their survivalist ways, bury or store the shark for several months before eating it, letting the toxic chemicals leach out through the skin and into the soil, or more likely these days, a plastic bucket. Mm -hmm. The flesh is then cut up into teeny tiny chunks and served on cocktail toothpicks to unsuspecting foreigners. <laughs> <laughs> My cousin Dan and I got the chance to try the Hawkart back in 2012 at a fish processing plant outside the city of Akureyri in northern Iceland. Iceland's entire population is only about 340,000 people, and I think that's rounding up. So the owner of the plant was supposedly the cousin of the lady who worked in the tourist office with whom we just met. She, in turn, had at some point dated our agent of the car rental office back in Reykjavik, who was apparently related to our flight attendant, and so on and so forth. Or perhaps the Icelanders were just messing with us. At any rate, we were sent several miles out of town to knock on the unassuming office door of a tall, broad-shouldered man named Elvar, decked out in a sort of full-body snowsuit the Icelanders are often seen wearing in the countryside to keep the snow, manure, and rotten, excuse me, fermented, <laughs> sharp, <laughs> off their sensitive Viking skin. <laughs> After giving us a tour of the plant, a quick tour, as every fish plant tour should be, <laughs> and showing us how he had enough free time that he'd learned to flip a quarter with a forklift, Elvar got down to business. He led us to a room full of people in similar coveralls. They all stood around chatting and drinking warm mugs of coffee. Wait here with my associates, Elvar said. I shall return. <laughs> now cousin Dan stands over six feet tall, and at this point in time, he was working as a firefighter, so was built to carry screaming humans out of burning buildings. Dan is not a small guy. But in this room full of Icelanders, this room full of Icelanders, all Viking stock with little outside breeding, absolutely towered over him. <laughs> in fact, they seemed to crowd around him in a sort of intentional intimidation circle. <laughs> I am cute and cherubic, so they mostly left me alone. <laughs> now please excuse my abrupt shift into the present tense, but I want you to really join me in this moment. As we're standing here, surrounded by these hulking brutes, Elvar returns with the fermented shark. <laughs> he presents it to us frozen in a tiny plastic container, and he hands us each a toothpick. The Vikings stare at us in, anticipa in anticipation, trying to hide their smirks. 
I am underwhelmed by the smell. Maybe it will taste worse, I think, hopefully. <laughs> Elvar removes the lid of the clear container. One after the other, Dan and I reach in with our toothpicks. We each take the tiniest piece we can find. I take a deep breath, I pinch my nose closed, and I put the shark meat in my mouth. The taste is like a sweet and savory blend of cantaloupe and blue cheese with just the slightest hint of day-old sushi. <laughs> but like day-old refrigerated sushi, it's really not that bad in the slightest. <laughs> the other tourists are all a bunch of whiners, I think to myself. They're making a big deal of nothing. These are just like little fishy popsicles. What's the big deal? Every single guidebook we've read about Iceland has warned us about the infamous Haukart, but to be honest, we can't see what all the fuss is about. Now, Dan and I are both smart people. We went to good colleges, and at 25, as I am on this trip, my work has already been circulated on national newsstands. Within a few years' time, though we don't know it yet, Dan will graduate from medical school. So, between the two of us, and our exceptional brains. <laughs> we have a brilliant idea. Let's take some of the how cart home. <laughs> Elvar, the friendly fisherman, agrees to our request with a smile. The rest of the Vikings continue to grin. On the house, Elvar says, proud of himself for his grasp <laughs> of this English idiom. <laughs> he disappears again and re-emerges with another, more official-looking container of Halkart. Dan hands him a few crisp bills of Icelandic krona, which he politely refuses, but only the first time. <laughs> Thanks so much for the tour, I say. Oh, thank you, Elvar says, kissing my hand in a way that is both charming and creepy. <laughs> Elvar walks us to our rental car and directs us to a farm a few kilometers down the road. Go and pet my horses, he says. They get lonely sometimes. <laughs> Dan opens the trunk of the SUV and slips the container of Halkart into his camping pack. <laughs> so we go, and we pet the horses, and we drive through more of the idyllic Icelandic countryside. We do all the Icelandic things we can think of. We eat skier, the local yogurt. We take pictures of strange geological formations. We ask people if they believe in elves and trolls. <laughs> we find an entire sheep's head for sale at a gas station mini-mart, and Dan asks the youthful blonde cashier if she likes to eat the eyeballs. <laughs> we visit our 4,000th waterfall. I feel deeply at peace, taking in the incredible scenery from the passenger seat of the car. Suddenly, Dan slams on the brakes. Traffic ahead of us is bumper to bumper. Somehow, we've already circled the country and have stumbled back on Reykjavik. It has only been five hours since we said goodbye to Elvar. That was it, we say simultaneously. <laughs> the guidebooks, the same ones that had warned us about the Halkart, had told us to plan at least two weeks for this road trip, but it has only been three days. In theory, we could do some research. We could explore some other places around the countryside. We could find something to do with the remaining week plus that we have left here. But Dan and I are impatient city kids. We are easily bored. So we stay two nights at a hotel in the city and party our brains out with the locals, at least to the extent that is possible. Most will only talk after three drinks and only dance after six. <laughs> Still not sufficiently entertained, we hop a flight to London, where we suspect the local party scene will be a bit more lively. Three hours later, we've landed at Heathrow Airport and are making our way to the baggage claim to pick up our trusty camping packs. <laughs> now in this moment, I want you all to pause, close your eyes if you like, and contemplate the worst smell you've ever <laughs> smelled. Have you ever worked in a morgue? I have. <laughs> this doesn't hold a candle. <laughs> now take a deep breath. Hold it for a moment. Exhale. <laughs> now, inhale deeply and take in the imaginary stench of a bus station bathroom at 4 a.m. Oh. on New Year's Eve. <laughs> 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 
If this doesn't strike a chord, think of a multi-cat litter box that hasn't oh. been emptied in weeks. <laughs> Maybe add some old garbage. <laughs> Exhale. Inhale again. Picture yourself in the seafood aisle at Wegmans. There has been an apocalypse. The power has been out for days. See that wild salmon over there? Take a whiff. <laughs> person you've ever sat next to on public transportation. <laughs> <laughs> Exhale. Inhale all these smells all at once, wafting together in their repulsive cacophony. <laughs> now, if your eyes are still closed, open them and hold this smell in your mind. <laughs> Picture a baggage carousel at Heathrow Airport. <laughs> Picture a yellow camping pack slowly inching toward you on the airport. As the bag gets closer, the smell gets worse and worse, inch by inch. Picture dozens of travelers from all over the globe slowly backing away from the Now picture Dan, nose pinched, face curled in horror, approaching the yellow <laughs> like Moses parting the red sun, <laughs> the traveler steps aside. <laughs> With outstretched arms, Dan lifts the pack and holds it as far away from his face as he can. Keeping his arms extended, he tiptoes to a bank of seats next to a large trash can. The lone traveler gets up, grabs his own bag, and quickly moves away. <laughs> Dan unzips the yellow pack. There is an audible gasp from someone nearby. <laughs> Possibly I am that <laughs> Holding my nose, I take a peek inside. The Tupperware is completely crushed. Tiny, warm chunks of putrid, rotting shark are all over his clothes, his shoes, everything. <laughs> The chunks are sticky and wet and cling to each one of the belongings that he carefully lifts out of the bag and drops directly into the adjacent trash can. A few t-shirts and a pair of jeans are salvageable, but he drops a whole pair of sneakers straight into the bin. Into the trash go books, socks, toiletries, electronics. Unfortunately, the worst of the stench seems to be coming from the pack itself, and Dan can't afford to go without that. Dan spends a futile 30 minutes scrubbing his remaining possessions in the bathroom sink while I scan a guidebook for the best fish and chips in London. <laughs> How I still have an appetite, I'll never know, but it is this exact ability that will later make me an excellent candidate for the funeral industry. <laughs> a year later, I'll find myself at the McDonald's drive through window, ordering chicken McNuggets to eat while I drive several boxfuls of cremated human remains back from New Jersey. <laughs> Finally, Dan emerges from the men's room with his pack on his back. The smell seems worse than when he started. <laughs> Perhaps the vigorous scrubbing motion has activated more scent particles. <laughs> but the journey must go on, and so Dan and I head down an escalator, excited to take our maiden voyage on the London Underground. Oh, no. Sadly, this voyage will be a lonely one. <laughs> As we take our seats on the tube, the closest passengers discreetly turn away. <laughs> At the first stop, several of them get off, only to board the adjacent cars on either side, the ones without us in them. <laughs> a few stops later, a family boards oblivious and sits down next to us. <laughs> Mommy, that man smells funny, the little girl says. I'm sorry, I say, to no one in particular, but really to everyone in the car. <laughs> we don't normally smell like this. It's fermented shark. It's an Icelandic delicacy. <laughs> no one says anything. <laughs> everyone just looks at their shoes. <laughs> 
Seven years later, I returned to Iceland with my husband to celebrate Christmas, New Year's, and our second wedding anniversary. The weather is unseasonably good, so in spite of the winter season and the limited daylight hours, we again managed to circumnavigate the entire country in just three days. <laughs> but we're also on a much tighter time frame, so we don't get the chance to visit Elvar and his fish processing oh. plant. <laughs> Instead, on our last day in Iceland, we head to the supermarket down the street from our Reykjavik Airbnb. Pablo locates the freezer section and fishes out a small Tupperware container of Halkart. I grab a large box of plastic Ziploc bags and shove it in our shopping basket. <laughs> Double bag it, I say. It's not worth the risk. <laughs> Twelve hours later, having made a brief stop in Toronto, the Halkart arrives safely at our Rochester apartment. There isn't so much as a crack in the Tupperware. I want to know how it smells, Pablo says, setting the package on our kitchen counter. <laughs> he opens the outermost of the four plastic bags I ultimately made him use to wrap the container. <laughs> the tiniest whiff of now defrosted Halkart escapes. Put it back! Put it back! I swear! <laughs> oh god, I know, I know, Pablo shouts back, zipping the bag and shoving the container back into the freezer. <laughs> It's been two weeks since that day, and still the how card sits there on the freezer shelf, watching. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting. Ladies, gentlemen, friends, family, mistakes were made, but lessons were most certainly not learned. <laughs>